In the last video, we explored Hitler's rise to power, from his imprisonment after the failed coup in Munich to his appointment as chancellor in 1933. So, Hitler is now chancellor, yes, but that doesn't really mean anything. Democracy in Weimar Germany still exists. We still have fair and free elections, freedom of the press, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, division of power and, and the Reichstag, hell, even Hindenburg is here. So here's how you destroy all that and overthrow democracy in five simple steps. On the evening of February 27, 1933, flames illuminated the night sky as the bastion of German democracy, the Reichstag building, burned in Berlin. A young Dutch communist named Marinus van der Lubbe was found inside the building, subsequently arrested and blamed for the fire. Hitler quickly seized the opportunity, blaming the fire on a communist plot to overthrow the government. Hitler then pressured Hindenburg to take immediate action against the communist threat. Sign this. Restriction of civil liberties, arrest and detention without trial, was... The day after the fire, Paul von Hindenburg signs the Reichstag Fire Decree, issued under quite a lot of pressure by Hitler and his cabinet. The decree suspended civil liberties, limited freedom of the press, and allowed for the arrest and imprisonment of political opponents without a trial. With the suppression of political opposition and the suspension of civil liberties, Hitler's government effectively eliminated many rivals and established control over key institutions. The speed with which the Nazis blamed the attack on the communists and the subsequent use of the event to consolidate power has led to many historians to argue that the Nazis had something to do with the fire. There is no definite evidence to determine the exact origin of the fire. Regardless of whether they are directly involved or not, it is clear that the Nazis rapidly exploited the fire to their advantage. Building on the momentum gained from the Reichstag Fire Decree and the electoral success in 1933, the Nazi party introduced the Enabling Act to the Reichstag on March 23, 1933. This is what the Enabling Act did. It granted legislative power to the cabinet, effectively bypassing the Reichstag. It suspended various fundamental rights and constitutional protections, including freedom of speech, press, assembly and association, it banned trade unions, and it also authorized the government to interfere with states' rights. In summary, the Enabling Act fundamentally removes the Reichstag from Hitler's way, funneling power straight to the Nazi party. We have a new fight. After suppressing, arresting, and eliminating your opposition, the next step is to control the institutions. The legal revolution, also known as Gleich The legal revolution, also known as Gleichschaltung, was the Nazi party's effort to tighten its control over Germany by synchronizing and coordinating all aspects and institutions of German society under Nazi control. The Nazis knew about the importance of image and media in controlling the country. In March 1933, Goebbels was appointed as Minister of Propaganda and started controlling the media to shape public opinion and disseminate propaganda. In April, non-Nazi newspapers were shut down or brought under Nazi control. On July 14, 1933, Hitler banned and merged all political parties into the Nazi party, which became the sole legal political entity in Germany. Hitler also replaced existing judges and lawyers with Nazi loyalists, giving him control over the legal system. The Nazi party also saw the importance of religion, and signed an agreement with the Vatican known as the Reich Concordat. The Concordat guaranteed certain rights and protections for the Catholic Church in Germany, all as long as the Catholic Church would not interfere with political matters in Germany. By controlling all aspects of society, the Nazis were able to eliminate all opposition and ensure that their ideology and their goals were the only ones that were allowed in Germany. On the night of June 29, 1934, 
A convoy of lorries filled with SS soldiers moved quickly through the night, unaware that this would be one of the most consequential and dramatic events in the consolidation of Hitler's power. During what would later be called the Night of the Long Knives, Hitler ordered the SS and the Gestapo to murder anyone he disliked or feared. This list not only included political opponents, but also people within the Nazi party, such as Gregor Strasser, a prominent member of the Nazi party who criticized Hitler's leadership, and longtime friend and ally Ernst Röhm. Röhm was the leader of the SA, but his ambitions and calls for the SA to become a paramilitary force in the German army had created tension. The Night of the Long Knives was Hitler's way to clean the house. He got rid of any political opponents and eliminated threats inside of the Nazi party. Hitler defended his actions, claiming that he was defending Germany against the plot by Rome and the, and I quote, degenerate homosexuals around him. Okay, let's go back and check how our democracy is doing. So the only thing left between Hitler and total control over Germany was an 86-year-old Paul von Hindenburg, who was serving as president of Germany at the time. On the evening of August 2nd, 1934, Paul von Hindenburg died. Hitler wasted no time, and on the same day, he merged the chancellorship with the presidency, effectively erasing Hindenburg's position and consolidating all power into his own hands making him the supreme leader of Germany. In the next episode, we will be going over part three and the experiences of Germans under the Nazi regime. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and check out more videos.